has been the curator and critic for Moscow, and I want to contribute to this uh, general discussion today about conception of, of I mean, about understanding of the phenomenon of, of, of war in post, in the recent, I would say, historical context, context of the post-Cold War time. So I, obviously, I'm going to, to focus my attention on how this problem was lived, experienced in, uh, in Russia, in Moscow, in the context which I'm, as far as I understand, I'm representing in this multinational, international conference. Uh, let me start, uh, let me start to mention one extremely obvious fact, but which is very often forgotten, ignored. Mm, I mean that for us in Russia, war, it's not something, how to say, hidden, um, something which is, uh, uh, I don't know, exists somewhere, um, on the television screen, for example. No, uh, war, it's something which we perfectly know. It's something which is part of our political, local political reality. I mean, war in Chechnya, which in fact we have for, for, for decades even more. But uh, what I'm, I want to discuss today is how art community, how art production reacted of the fact that we are a country which has a, practically a civil war on its territory for a very, very long time. And what is the most interesting, that art had no clear, obvious reaction on that fact. Practically, we have no work in the last 15 years, in the whole post-Soviet period, focused precisely on that phenomenon. No artist wanted seriously to explore this phenomenon. Why? It's what I'm going to... I'm trying in a very, very synthetic and laconic way, schematic even way, to discuss with you today. Uh, on the screen, you have uh, a material related to a project of mine, which, as a curator, I've done in 1995 in a Russian pavilion in Venice Biennial. This work was done, and by the way, I'm very proud that uh, this work was signed by four authors, three artists and curator. So I was accepted by my... Uh, by three artists as a co-author of this work. Uh, I'm not going to, to speak in details about this project. In fact, I've done it yesterday in, in Apple. Uh, but just I want to mention that one of our, that was 1995, the topic of the biennial proposed by General Commissioner Jean Claire was identity. It was the first time when on the Russian pavilion, on the facade of Russian pavilion, instead of Soviet Union, appeared Russian Federation. So, in fact, it was completely obvious, absolutely obvious from the beginning that we, for author of the project, we should in some way investigate the identity of Russia. One of the spaces, in fact, what came out, it was a synthetical uh, collective installation, collective project, which presumed uh, you know, big installation, and uh, you have on the screen the big image which you see. It's uh, in fact the last space, uh, and in this space we installed this um, uh, this box um, destined to collect money, because we thought that one of the identity of Russia nowadays it's I repeat I'm very schematic. Um, it's to collect money. Uh, and then we realized that, okay, we are installing this box, we are collecting money, but what for? One of the ideas which came into our, our mind was, of course, to collect it for the victim of Chechen war. In fact, I even established, I even contacted um, one non-governmental -govern organization, which very, which absolutely, you know, unsuspectable reputation, which 
agree to, 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 to help us and to be mediator between our project and, and, uh, and uh, Chechnya, uh, I mean Memorial. But if, but after a long, a long discussion, uh, we decided not to collect money for victims of Chechen wars, but to collect it for artificial reasons. Well, I'm not going to explain you what exactly we meant with artificial reason because it's profoundly rooted in 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 the whole in the whole installation in the whole installation artificial re n n n n reason. In fact, it's related to the space to the to, to, to the previous spaces of of the whole pavilion installation. But important is that we, after a long long discussion, we decided not to do it. Why? Frankly, I don't remember exactly how we formulated it in that precise moment. It was exactly 10 years ago. But if I have to explain why we avoided it and why all other artists avoided it, I think that there were four reasons. I repeat, I'm very schematic, but there were four reasons. Or if you, were, if you, want, to, if you want for traps, uh, which in reality imposed to the whole discursive constellation of the 90s, and in fact this, this project was done in the middle of the 90s, which in fact avoided artists to take a critical position, which uh, avoided appearance on the Russian, and from my point of view, even in the whole post-Soviet uh, art scene, I would say even in the whole Eastern European, post-communist art scene, an appearance of the critical artist in, let's say, Western sense of this, of this term. I think that one of the first reasons, the first trap, was that to criticize Chechen war, to, I mean, to, to appear on the stage with a critical statement, uh, and to denounce, to accuse, immediately presumed that that was the logic of the, of the time, that you are working for opposition to, let's say, this neoliberal regime which was instead, which was which established with its minimum, how it lab, labeled itself, how it's proclaimed itself to be in uh, Russian post-Soviet time. I mean, Yeltsin and his so-called young reformer and all his political, political group. So to denounce them, even having an absolutely obvious and strong uh, arguments, immediately presumed that you're working for opposition. And opposition was mostly Communist Party. It's me to criticize Yeltsin, presumed immediately that you are nostalgic communist, communist and you want to go back to the Soviet, Soviet time. There were practically no space in between. Obviously, power use it. Obviously, power imposed this kind of this kind of con discursive condition, but that was a reality. The only one why way out was how to say to, to establish a certain what could be named in a very vulgar way what could be named a vulgar postmodernist position, in a sense that to oppose to incapacity to take a critical position, to oppose to it the certain ironical position, uh, the position of absolutely ironical, skeptical, and liberatorial, cynical approach to the whole political context of the time. So I'm not with you, but I'm not with them. I'm not working for, for, for Yeltsin rhetoric, but I also have no nostalgia about the past. I just simply enjoy my own individual position, my own individual experience. But how, and this is a second trap, of course, uh, but what does it mean to take an ironical position? In reality, it's, I mean, how it, I mean, it's mean how you are, you could justify yourself as an intellectual, as a creative person. It's mean, but you could justify yourself um, saying that I'm, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm intellectual. 
I'm a creative person because I'm creative. <laughs> Look how, how I'm creative. It means to, that these intellectuals and this artists were proposing their own creativity as a value in itself. It's what I'm. Um, uh, it's what I'm uh, usually labeling as, as a, let's say, va vulgar understanding of postmodernist position, which was, by the way, which has a lot, a lot of um, uh, critical, um, uh, critical, uh, critical aim, critical basis in reality, which was absolutely ignored. Practic practically, it's presumed. You know, intellectual for itself. You presume the play with intellectual metaphor for itself, evaporating the whole critical substance which could be behind it. Uh, and in this case, um, let's say, of obviously, French philosophers uh, became idols of, let's say, of, of this intellectual milieu. And if um, uh, Baudrillard wrote his famous book about the uh, war, I mean the war in, in, in Persic Gulf, and it, it, it's named his book, Le Golf Persic n'est pas en lieu. So I would say that this kind of position presumes that um, uh, Chechen, the Chechnya n'est pas, pas en lieu. The Chechnya has no place. And in some way, it was being understood in a very, very direct sense. It's practically presumed that really this phenomenon, it's not part of our life, it's not part of our experience, it's, it's an existent. If to be more close to the art scene, to the art experience, um, I would say that if, I mean, these two, it's, these two traps which I mentioned before are discursive, are general. But if to come more directly to art scene and to the experience of the artist in the 90s, I'm not, now I'm speaking about the 90s, uh, there were two more traps. The first trap mm, is related to how does it to how to the identity of the artist in post 19 in the post Soviet uh, context. In that context, mm, I would say the most obvious uh, characteristic quality of that context, it was in existence of institutions. Institutions were paralyzed by economical and social chaos, uh, disappeared, and uh, practically people who practiced art, and I would say art understood in, I mean, internationally understood, I don't mean uh, traditional artists, who inherited, inherited their position of the artists from the Soviet time, who produced uh, uh, former official artists, who produced uh, painting, landscape, portraits, I mean, who used to work in academic tradition. The artists who are practicing art, I mean, which we are all together considering art, in reality, the identity of the professional identity, these artists got from the West. And in fact, inside the country, they were considered to be artists because they, are, uh, they were considered by artists in the West. In fact, I remember perfectly that once uh, when I got an award uh, for the best uh, curator and critic of the year, and in fact, it, I was uh, only one nominated, uh, and only one who got this award because this prize disappeared. Of course, as, as most of the things which um, appeared in the 90s. Mm, but uh, uh, the commentary of the journalist uh, in one of the television pro the project was Viktor Vizianov, critic and curator, unknown in Russia, but very well known in the West. And that was the best compliment in that moment. I mean, I mean, I mean liberal journalism, progressive journalism who fight for modernization and innovation of the, of the cultural and artistic system in, in, in a country. So artists were considered artists because they were considered artists in the West. But in the West, these artists were considered not artists, but they're considered to be, first of all, Russian artists. Mm -hmm. So appearing in the West, mm, these people were confronting the situation that the Russiousness as a label as a quality, as an identity, it was practically, they were stigmatized with this quality. They were obliged to produce not just an art, but they were obliged to produce, first of all, Russian art. 
So to appeal on international <coughs> art scene with a, with a critique of Chechen wars immediately presumes that this, this artists are conformist because they are satisfying Western request for correct international artists from Russia. So he is very progressive. He is criticizing Chechen war. And if the artist is really progressive, <laughs> it's really, really non-conformist, obviously he wanted to, 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 to avoid such a, such a stigmatization. So for him to express his critical position was not to speak about Chechnya, but to criticize the art system itself. And first of all, to criticize post-colonial discourse, to criticize, oh, to criticize many, 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 um, I mean, the logic of global art scene, which is imprinting, in, you know, imposing to the artists from peripheral uh, countries to represent their own nationality, ethnic identity, and their own local condition. So Chechnya doesn't fit at all in, in this kind of discourse, in this kind of critical position. This is international context. But the, four, the second trap, and or fourth trap, was in fact the local <coughs> And the local context, in fact, mm, I mean, put, I mean, imposed to the artist another complex of problems. Uh, you know, Russian philosopher uh, Valery Padaroga once uh, said me mm, in a private conversation, probably Lev uh, probably was also present that day because it was done in the frame of visual anthropology workshop, which you visited once. And I can even check and control if it was said at that precise moment. Uh, but he said one, one sentence, if Soviet Union died, it means that everything is allowed. Obviously, that was a reference to famous uh, Dostoevsky saying, if the God is died, it means that everything is allowed. And in reality, this bon mot, this saying, was addressed to the total social, political, and also discursive chaos which triumphed in the country. Uh, neoliberal reforms imposed to the country total fragmentization of everything, total atomization of the reality. So the whole context in the 90s was practically uh, a general war of everybody with everybody against everybody, with everybody. So it was a total, total condition of the war as an everyday experience, as an everyday conditions. Uh, because what it was triumphing, it was triumphing, obviously, in the exaggerated individualism, the wish, desire, obsessive desire of success, or desperate desire of survival. In such a context, to speak about, to focus your attention precisely on phenomenon of Chechen wars would be, would, be, would be false. Because Chechen war considered to be a part of this general condition, which was a condition of a war, as an everyday experience. It's the reason, finally, why nobody, nobody practically touched this topic, this political topic, this social topic, this phenomenon. Because, I mean, any statement pronounced in that moment was practically about that. So it was not necessary to have a direct reference. And even this direct reference um, was in some way, I think, compromising the statement. Because it was too obvious, too journalistic, too, too I mean, too, too instrumentalized. So denounce the war was practically to denounce everyday experience. Uh, so to emphasize, to impose, I mean, so I would say to establish, to establish a critical position in such a context. I repeat, I'm, I'm very schematic. I'm very schematic. I'm obliged to be um, very schematic. But um, a critical position could be expressed in in that time, in the 90s, I would say in two forms. Uh, the one form was 
to focus your attention on the phenomenon of communication. Because if, this, if the, the general condition is a war about, of everybody against everybody, this is an everyday condition, and this is an existential, social, political, discursive condition, it means that this is also a condition of communication. And it means that there is no general discourse. It means that to practice a sta artistic statement which presumes that communication exists, it's been false. And it's mean simulation, it's mean imitation of how to say of uh, of normal uh, discursive condition. And this is a confirmation because it's it's what exactly power wants. Power wants. To, to, to create an image uh, that everything is okay, that everything is normalizing, that we step by step we are going towards stabilization, and, to, and, uh, um, and we have a common language in our country. So, to, if you want to, in, to emphasize a critical statement, you should, in reality, perform incapacity to be understandable. You should emphasize incapacity to be to be to be communicative. You should perform lack of communication. And um, if to give you a concrete example, so on the screen you see one of the most recent project uh, of uh, of Yuri Leiderman, who in fact is an artist of the. Who, I mean, who appeared on the Moscow art scene actively in the 90s. And this is a work, as you, I mean, Dutch people, I think, immediately understand that this is a work about the war. Because Anna Frank, uh, images of Anna Frank are appearing um, uh, from the photos. So most of the photos are related to Anna Frank, are related to her family, to her case, to her story, and to Amsterdam as a context. Well, this is one of the reasons why I also wanted to show this work. Uh, uh, but this work was presented in Shanghai Biennial uh, in 2000, 2004, I think it was. Uh, uh, it's yeah. Um, but before, I mean, in the middle of this image, you see these th three characters who are Chinese uh, um, uh, young actors invited by Yuri Leiderman as a part of his project. They are dressed in a national costume of uh, Chinese, uh, different Chinese minorities. And in fact, it's, it had a lot of problems uh, with that because, um, I mean, Chinese authorities were quite uh, accepted it with, a, with enormous suspect. I mean, because the problem of minorities is crucial for China. Uh, and these uh, three young actors dressed in an absolutely a very strange costume. So they are they look Chinese for us probably or Oriental Ch or, or Oriental for us. Yeah, but for Chinese people, for the Chinese audience, they were also immediately understood as exotic and strange. So familiar but strange and unidentifiable, even if these are a costume of minorities of China, but very unknown minority. In fact, it's, it's what power wants a minority to be unknown. unknown. And these uh, three characters doing this performance in front of the portraits, um, which are in reference to Second World War and to, to, to Holocaust uh, drama, they are playing they're doing very strange and ununderstandable ritual. They're playing with these mushrooms. Well, mushroom as a mo wooden, wooden, wooden mushrooms. Mushrooms, as, I mean, as, as a motif, as, as, I mean, as an icon, it has many, 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 many meanings. Uh, it's very enigmatic, but full of, of meanings at the same time. It's what Yuri Lederman wants. He wants to create for us the certain, how to say, illusion of, communi of, of, of communication, but in, that immediately does to destroy it, to make us understand that behind these obvious uh, meanings of war, of holocaust, of, 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 of drama, behind it there is a lot, a lot of other references, enigmatic, um, secret, unknown, 
and probably more important and probably more meaningful. Uh, so this is one of the examples of Yuri Lederman works, which, I repeat, it's exactly focused on this phenomenon, perform in capacity to communicate, to perform in capacity to express the phenomenon of the world. But the second position, this very typical position also for, for the 90s, another position quite typical for the 90s, it's, it was represented in a more obvious way by the artist I think in Holland quite well known, because he spent two months in a prison here, um, I mean Alexander Brenner. Uh, in fact, Alexander Brenner is and only one artist who created a, a work precisely related to Chechen war. Uh, that was a performance, it was an action. He appeared in the most important Orthodox cathedral of Moscow with, uh, I mean, with zero copies uh, of, uh, of the text. At the text, it was his declaration. He officially declared that he is taking responsibility of the Chechen wars and of the crimes in Chechnya on himself. The text was, now I am responsible for that war. I am responsible for that disaster. Russia, you could have a breeze of freedom. Now you are absolutely, go ahead, go ahead without any responsibility. I am responsible for that war. So that was practically the sense of the message and as a sense of the, of, the, of the action. But if the artist, if one artist is establishing a position that he is unable to speak about the Chechen war, another is producing something totally opposite. He not simply speaks about Chechnya, but takes responsibility of the whole events of himself. But what does it mean? Mm, in the same time, of course, if Yuri Leiderman, enigmatic, strange, uh, ununderstandable. Sometimes he has a lot of very secret and understandable messages. Uh, all Brenner's actions, first of all, they are not installations, not works, but usually actions. Very quick, very simple, very synthetical. So something absolutely opposite from point of view of logic of communication. Alexander Brenner is absolutely understandable. He is absolutely he's anecdotically clear in all his in all his in all his um, uh, statements, in all his works, as he was also in Stedelijk Museum when he vandalized uh, 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 Malevich picture. It means that he wants to be over understood, as he's taking, if he's taking, taking over responsibility, so he wants to be also absolutely understandable. But in such a context, if you're taking such a responsibility, it means that you are practically becoming identical to the condition of the general war of everybody to everybody. Because Yuri Leiderman refusing to speak about Chechen war, refusing to speak about, um, um, about, about the war in a clear way, that was for him to mention that that was for him only one possibility to establish a distance. In, um, in Alexander Brenner's case, it's totally opposite. If he's taking responsibility for the war, if, he's, if he wants to speak the language, the, 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 if he wants to communicate in the way understandable for, for the reality of the general war of everybody with everybody, it means he is becoming one of the soldiers of that war. And in, fact, and in fact, he was. And in fact, taking responsibility of the Chechen war, he allowed to himself to attack and practically to kill or as minimum to commit to commit a criminal act. If he is responsible for the crimes of Russia in Chechnya, he is also he can also produce crimes. And in fact, in, in, here in Amsterdam, he produced a crime. He wanted it and he produced it, and he paid what he must pay for that. Of course, uh, behind these two positions, there were contradictions. Because um, when Yuri Leiderman was performing on capacity to communicate, he was still communicating. 
and obviously it's presumed that as minimum on the horizon of his individual poetic communication as a norm existed because he was simply performing incapacity to respect communication as a norm. The same is with, 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 with Brenner. Emphasizing incapacity, I mean, in, 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 in reality, emphasizing incapacity to be critical in articulated and precise way, he was, he in some way, make us understand that probably in another condition you could denounce the war, but not be criminal of the war in the same time. And in fact, um, it's appeared later, this new condition where you can criticize the war or where you can be communicated, it's appeared later. It's appeared, let's say, in, in this new decade, in post-90s decade. In the early, in the late 90s, early, I mean, new decade, post-90s post decade, in, I think it was 2000, 2000 2001, when f definitely it was formed a group which, from my point of view, is one of the most original and interesting phenomenon of the Moscow art scene, I mean, of the Russian art scene, uh, because it's, it's, by the way, it's phenomenon not only not which existed between Moscow and Petersburg, but even they are in, inside this, this group, of, uh, group of artists and intellectuals, there are also um, uh, citizens of Germany, United States, and so on. Mm, I mean, a group named Что делать in Russian, which in fact is what is to be done. Uh, the name of this group, it's, it's obviously, it's a, it's, it's a reference to, to Lenin, famous Lenin book. And this is a group of intellectuals who are defending um, necessity and possibility of, of a critical position. Critical position which, I mean, which how it's understood internationally, how it's understood in the Western world, or how it's understood in general in, let's say, in, uh, in contemporary global world. So this is a group of people who are defending uh, values of critical discourse. What is interesting is that, first of all, it became possible only because they are a group, only because they created the certain, uh, out, what, I, what I used to name in, uh, in one of my texts, zone of autonomy and zone of solidarity. So they created a network of connections and thanks for this capacity to communicate in between them, not with the society, not with the general media, not with the political condition of the country. No, but inside the small group, inside the small reservation, they created communication, they created self-understanding, self they, con they created condition of collective discursive production. And only thanks for that, they, 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 they are able to produce a critical position. In fact, they then, um, extremely important key element of the activity of the group is uh, a, a newspaper, in fact, which is uh, named Что uh, делать, what is to be done. It's bilingual, it's Russian and, and English, so it's understandable internationally. This is basically also quite important um, for, for the identity or for the program, for the position of this group. They want to be international, they want to be understood internationally. For Brenner, that was absolutely not necessary, of course, um, because he was not speaking, his poetic presumed not a language, but something beyond language or before language. Uh, and every issue of the magazine, I have to say, they, um, uh, I have to say they produce several issues. 
uh, if to be precise, none of these issues was focused on the war. But it's absolutely possible. Because their critical position, presuming that one day they have to touch it. Well, first of all, after the appearance of Tony Negri in Farnbrook, I have said that they will do it, because Negri, for them, it's, for them it's, it's an important reference. And uh, this is a work, in fact, dedicated to Tony Negri. This is a work named uh, Negation of Negation. And uh, this is a work which is consisting of three elements, of three video screening. Sometimes it's screening on the wall, sometimes it's screening on the monitor. Uh, but it's video installation which consists of three elements. On the one, we see social forum in Paris. And this part of the installation is named Screaming. In fact, it's representing different delegations which are screaming slogans, political slogans, everybody in his own language. is in French, in Spanish, in Italian, in Korean, in Serb-Croatian, or no, excuse me, in Serbian or in Croatian. Mm, uh, uh, they are screaming in, uh, I mean, in the most, the most exotic language, uh, languages. So, so he performed international of protest. On another of another yeah on the second on the second uh, screen he presented precise documentation of the first public Tony Negri speech after after the liberation from the prison. In fact, it was happened in the frame of the same social forum. And he spoke in this meeting, in this, I mean, he came in the aula, but there was, it was so crowded. There was a lot of people outside the aula who wanted to listen to him. So he, as an old revolutionary, he said, let's go out, let's go on, let's go on the square. So they went on the square and he spoke with the same people whom we saw before, screamings. Now, in total silence, listened for the words of uh, intellectual. This time it was a total silence. It was only intellectual to speak. And he used to speak about the lavoro, work, labor. <coughs> and in fact, the third element of this, uh, of this um, installation presumed um, documentation of the Gorky factory, car factory, Nizhny Novgorod factory, which was built in 1927 by Ford. So it's a classical industrial uh, factory. In fact, he was, in which, in fact, it's a classical example of Fordist, uh, by the way, this is a system, Fordist economy in Russia. In fact, Fordist economy is a term of Paolo Virna, who is a friend of Tony Negri, who is from the same intellectual group, and of course, who is a cult figure for, for, for what is to be done group of intellectuals. So, these people can denounce social and political disasters. They can denounce injustice. They can denounce, um, you know, global capitalism. But they can do it in a limited sphere of zones of autonomy, zones of solidarity, remaining absolutely understandable to the whole of society, because there is no political and social context for such a critical, authentic, critical, neo-Marxist, neo-leftist discourse in the country. And this position is criticized. This position is criticized by, let's say, by, by a group of artists, but the most severe in his critique is uh, Anatolia Smolov. <coughs> uh, and he's representing, let's, let's say, the second poem in the post 90s situation. Paradoxically, he's an artist of the 90s. He is one of the artists who established discourse of the 90s. Paradoxically, he is an artist who obsessively tried to establish a critical discourse in the 90s. This is one of the performances organized by Smolovsky during 1996 um, the political campaign when he supported the movement of vote against everybody. In fact, we have this possibility to vote against everybody. 
against all candidates. And in fact, that was his neo-anarchistic, if you want, but very clearly political position, uh, denounced, he denouncing the whole false political system in the country. But now um, he's so nobody. <laughs> In uh, 1996, in fact, just to reconfirm that he is really critically, which obviously for <laughs> the total majority of the population, absolutely understandable. But his position is definitely changed, and Uh, from, from the new decade, he absolutely refused obvious political meanings in his work. And he, his polemic with, with what is to be done group, uh, his, um, his basic argument is that political position, critical position, it's also very much requested by global capital. Uh, it's also it's also it's also obvious. It's also banal. It's also part of the establishment. <coughs> so the real critical position should come back to Theodore, to, to Theodore Adorno's idea of autonomy of art. Only proposing interesting, good, high quality art, art which profoundly reflects its own mediums, which profoundly reflects its own position. You can be critical. So you can come back to the system. And in fact, by the way, the system is appeared. It, this institutional collapse, so typical for the 90s, it's substituted by, by something which really looks like, it, like as minimum as a, as a premises of the of the of the normal internationally validated art system. So in fact, we have come back to the art system, but we should criticize it from inside. And we should use language of art. So he definitely came back to, to, to let's say, modernist, classical modernist position. He came, if you want a direct reference, he came back to Clement Greenberg uh, position. In fact, uh, in the recent uh, the, in the issue of Moscow Art Magazine, which I'm going to publish, the next issue, um, uh, I'm going to, to publish first time in Russian language, Art, art and Teach, Alan Gart and Teach of Clement Greenberg with introduction of Anatoly Smolovsky. And this neo-modernistic position, which um, it's, for him, it's, it's, it's reconquested political criticism. Art should not scream. Art should be silent. And you are denouncing the disasters throughout the, throughout the silence, not screaming, not direct messages. And finally, uh, finally, um, and finally, the third pole, the third position. I repeat, I'm very, very schematic, but I want to be clear and want to be and want to be communicative. Um, so the third position, uh, presume it's in between. It's in between, and this position. Uh, it's trying not to be neo-ideologically obvious. It doesn't want to be clear, very much clear in messages, but obviously not neo, at the same time it's not neo-modernistic. It's a position which, from my point of view, it's close to some ideas of George Agamben when he's speaking about bare life. This is a position which wants to see the things as the things are, suspending the judgments. This is a position which was absolutely impossible in the 90s, because in the 90s he was absolutely unable to see the reality. In fact, only reconquested autonomy of art gave to the artist a chance of a gaze, of a gaze to the reality, because Brenner was inside the reality, Lederman was outside of reality. All these saints for reconquested autonomy, artists, from that platform, 
I mean, they're able to see what it's what surrounds them, and they want to get maximum of resources which gives them this capacity to gaze, just to see, just to gaze what surrounds them. I'm going to show you a work, one of the work of, from my point of view, one of the most interesting artists of the Moscow art scene today. It's Olga Chernyshova. It's her most recent video work. Uh, it was done, in fact, it was filmed. It's a video. It's a very laconic video. It's a six minutes video. Uh, she done it, uh, we can even, we can even uh, recall, reconstruct uh, the day, because it was a day when um, in Singapore, um, uh, Olympic um, committee was choosing the city where the Olympics, the next Olympics, where the Olympic Games should, should happen. And Moscow was one of the candidates. Uh, and the whole Moscow was transformed into the general, into the very artificial and very kitschy fist, pumped, created, pumped, simulated by by uh, by Moscow mayor, who really wanted very much to to get to get this chance, uh, to get this, <coughs> to, 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 to mean to, to nominate, I mean to 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 to, to, to win, and he was probably sure that Moscow will be the, the city of Olympic Games. So the whole, in the, in the many places of Moscow, there were organized uh, feasts, uh, orchestra, uh, dancers, and things like that. So that precise day, Olga filmed. Olga filmed this video. Uh, it's filmed in front of the very precise place, very much related to the war, by the way, because it's, she's done this film, behind, before the facade, but in, in reality, this is a strange building which has no facade, uh, main facade. It's, it's, it's a building which um, has a form of, the, of, the, of a star. <coughs> uh, and this is a theater of the Red Army. It's an enormous building done in neoclassical uh, style um, uh, in the Stalin age. So it's very much related to, 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 to army, because even star, it's, 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 it's a symbol of the, of the Red Army. And you see kids dressed in the military costumes. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, Lief or Stefan, I mean, who knows what, I mean, who has a, who are here, and who, probably Maria too, I mean, as um, you have an experience of, let's say, of, of, uh, of socialism behind, um, you would immediately understand the total, total idiocy of what is happening. Because it's very bizarre mixture of different styles of, of reawaked old style of, uh, I mean, old-fashioned Stalin style, because kids dressed in the military costumes, and the music of march, of military march, and in the same time, you see uh, half-naked girls um, dancing in between these kids dressed in the military, in front, in front of the theater of the Soviet army, of the Red Army. A total poopery of different styles, a total eclectics, no idea, a totally ideal, a total ideological eclectics. And what is also extremely important that this experience of gazing uh, bare life give you a lot, a lot of information. There is no clear judgment in, in, her, in her work, but a lot of a lot of authentic information, and you immediately understand how false is what we see in front of us, how it's simulated, how it's absolutely artificial, and how many crimes are behind it. And in fact, probably, uh, this is the best way to confront the phenomenon. Well, if I spoke today about capacity on capacity to speak about Chechen wars, in reality, this attempt to suspend a direct critical judgment, but to gaze the reality. Probably it's the most authentic position today, I think. Because in reality, what we know about the Chechen wars, to say that this is a confrontation between neo-colonial 
Putin power and national liberatorian movement. It's not authentic. In reality, everything is mixed. There is a lot of business behind, a lot of, a lot of neoliberal, neo-globalist neo interest behind, a lot of small crimes, a lot of individual crimes. It's much more complex. It's much more um, less obvious than any denouncing position, any denouncing discourse school system could, 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 could establish. So now let me show you this video.